Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's special webinar, Designing Open Building Automation Systems, sponsored by TRAIN. I'm Rob McManamy, and Editor-in-Chief of HPAC Engineering Magazine with Endeavor Business Media, and we're excited to have you all joining us today. Um, to begin with, for this webinar, let, let's explain a little bit about how you can participate in today's presentation. First of all, if you have any technical difficulties during the session, please put your question in the questions window and our technical experts will help you out. We recommend disabling any pop-up blocking software or extensions in your browser as these can cause issues with the webinar player. Now, additionally, we, uh, we welcome your questions during today's event. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation. But please feel free to send in your questions at any time. Uh, to do so, simply type your questions into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the submit button. Uh, also, please be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the HPAC engineering website, hpac.com. Within the next week, it'll be posted and uh, um, you'll be notified by email when the archive is available. Now let's meet today's speakers. Uh, Melissa Schumann is the control sales support leader for the train commercial, for train commercial North America. Chuck Lane is a systems application engineer for train commercial North America. And Andrew Disher is the National Controls Business Development and Commercialization uh, Specialist for Train Commercial HVAC North America as well. So let me turn things over to our presenters. And uh, while well, the floor is yours, whoever wants to go first here. All right, thanks a bunch. This is Andrew Disher talking, and I'll run through the first part of this session with you. Uh, just quick look at the agenda of what's ahead of you for the next 58 minutes here. Uh, we'll do some uh, discussion around customer goals invol involving system integration and open systems. We'll discuss what open systems even means because it means different things to different people. Uh, we'll do a, uh, an overview of open protocols and uh, specifically focus in on BACnet. Uh, we'll also then talk about how to specify open systems and the customer value that correlates with that and give you a little run through of a design tool that we can provide to help in that specifying effort uh, called Train Design Assist. So if we look at what customer goals are for, for open systems, when we hear from the hundreds of customers we interact with on an annual basis, what they want out of an open system, uh, first on the list there is they want that flexibility to choose the best in class product or the best in class service or installation entity. So they wanna be able to choose an open system so that they can have the best product for the best application for whatever they're trying to accomplish. Uh, if they're in a commercial real estate uh, uh, environment or a K through 12 or higher ed or data center, whatever it is, they wanna be able to have an open system that allows them to choose whatever best product for that, for that building is and also have the peace of mind that it's not going to lock them down in some way that they're going to have everything they need to be successful in the in the future and that they can choose the best installer in the market and the best servicing entity in the market to suit their needs and so that's a customer goal in terms of open systems another is open data collection so this one's huge uh, by installing a system today customers that we interact with want to be in, want to be sure that they're going to have the the data that they can uh, they can use to leverage whatever they need to in the future or today they want to be able to manage energy they want to have insights into how their buildings operating they want to be able to see uh, which equipment needs to be serviced and rank and prioritize what's happening in that building and it all starts with data and we've heard We've heard from some customers who, who think they're getting an open system, and then they find out that actually the data they need isn't there to interoperate with whatever platform they wanna use for energy analysis, for building management, for whatever they want to do, and that can be a real pain point. It can be a real pain point, and sometimes they even say, well, why didn't my engineer protect me from this? Why didn't I 
have a design that protected me so that I had the data I needed to be successful with. Another consideration or another customer goal for some folks is an open and flexible infrastructure. Being able to integrate multiple vendors, uh, multiple technologies of varying uh, either new uh, control systems or legacy, and being able to be future-proofed for whatever technology they may want to leverage in the future. So being able to design an open system so that they're not locked in, they're not locked into one technology, they're not locked into one vendor, they're not locked into one provider, but being able to have that flexible infrastructure to leverage the data across systems. The last customer goal we're highlighting here is around open service and open tools. So people don't wanna get locked into service providers. They wanna have the tool set to be able to minimize issues as they come up, definitely minimize finger pointing uh, if, if that's ever an issue that, that may arise and effectively service and get their system back up and running if there's something that arises in the building. And by leveraging an open tool set where anybody can service, anybody can, can uh, help, or where they can be as self-servicing as possible is very open. Uh, so what we wanted to, to start with here is what are the customer goals? What are we trying to solve here? And try to keep that uh, first and foremost and, and center of mind as we go through this discussion. An example of what success might look like, and this may be a very small subset of all the buildings to have a lot of different systems all converged onto one uh, large network, but there's a lot of different systems and by utilizing open protocols, for example, such as BACnet over IP, we can have all of these systems integrated together, sharing data, leveraging the insights across different systems, and ultimately working better for the owner or operator or whoever owns that, that building and is, is responsible for taking care of that building. The challenge here is open means different things to different people. And so if you say, I want an open system, without more information, that can be really challenging to figure out, well, what exactly does somebody want? And so when we, we talk to people, we found some common threads and we're able to bucket it into various definitions of what an open system means for different people. First and foremost is open distribution. You know, we, we hear that a lot. I want some, you know, open distribution could be a definition of open for some open tools, and then open protocols. And so we're gonna dive into each of these a little bit more in depth as we go through. In terms of open distribution and service, the goal is customers don't want to be locked into a single source, a single provider, and not be able to be flexible with their service model. And they wanna avoid perceived potential high costs by doing so, or, they want to be able to have flexibility to have hybrid multiple people or, or change providers or even be as self-servicing as possible. And that's the goal. That's what you want out of open distribution. It might be that you want multiple bids on a, on a project to get a better cost and, and, uh, or flexibility going through the, into the future. But some considerations here are systems can really be difficult to service by anybody except the person who originally installed it. Unless it's really well documented, unless it's standardized in some way, uh, unless that, that programming is, is uh, you know, captured and all the nuances of that system, it can be really difficult for another servicing entity to walk up to a, a building they're not familiar with and service somebody else's installation. And so we'll talk about some ways that we can, we can mitigate some of these circumstances. And that's especially true of some of the more completely custom from the ground up solutions that have no real standardization built in. Uh, some systems that claim to have open distribution and service, uh, the resulting service, anybody can service the system on day, day two of that installation. Um, they often have many difficulties too. It could be considerations of quality. You know, when you open up distribution, uh, quality control can be a concern. Uh, when you open up distribution, the, the number of people who do 
any specific brand could be a concern. So different tool sets that are needed, which we'll talk a, lo a little bit later. And some systems are not even configured to allow others to integrate. There could be licensing situations where systems are that, that appear to be open are actually locked down and the truth is not what they were uh, what they were expecting. And so when we're looking at this open distribution, we have to center around the fact that that service and that installation quality depends on the people and the knowledge and, and the support mechanism for that manufacturer, that vendor, that provider. The next, next aspect we can look at is open tool sets. So what we hear from customers is they want an open tool, again, that will lock them or, or will, will prevent them from being locked into that single service provider. Uh, maybe it's they don't want to have expensive ongoing licensing costs, or it can enable their them and their team to take on whatever portion of that service that they're comfortable taking on. And so they want the open tools, they want to own the tools, they want to be able to have that uh, the the tools necessary to troubleshoot to service the system. Some challenges, some considerations on the flip side is. Licensing costs can become either really expensive or really undefined whenever uh, certain tools are deployed, and that can be a consideration. And not all tools get what you want out of the system. Some systems require a tool to do just this one little section of the system, say system control, uh, versus another tool for the unit controllers, the equipment in the on the project, or even other mechanisms. And so the tools can get really complex, there could be multiple tools involved, and it can get really, really challenging to wrap your head around what exactly do you need to service the system. The last aspect of open, what open means to different people, is protocols. So the goal around open protocols, which the industry has you know, been, been uh, using for a long, long time now, is to enable that interoperability between multiple manufacturers, multiple vendors, multiple providers. And that includes the, the building automation system as well, not just integrating equipment controllers into the system level or the building automation system uh, control, but also across multiple building automation systems from system to system and having that open protocol model where these systems can truly share data and interoperate. Uh, this also allows the customer to select that best in class product. And some considerations here are, you know, uh, not all systems that, that, uh, that use BACnet or other open standard protocols actually have the same level of functionality. So there's some, there's some testing and things that we would advocate for and that we can advise on. Uh, problems can still arise between multiple vendors in terms of addressing or functionality. And so there's some tool sets that by using open protocols, we can utilize to help troubleshoot and mitigate that. And not all systems are truly open. Some systems are very good at integrating between equipment level and system level, but aren't as effective at integrating at the top side. And so what we see is even some that do utilize open protocols don't share the whole data set. They just share a smaller subset of the data, thus breaking that customer goal of having the data they need to be successful. With that, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, you know, just say, don't specify a technology. This is the idea. This is whatever you do in, in terms of a, the right system design for a project or a product or a customer. We want to get away from specifying any given technology and really specify according to the functionality that we want out of that system. So let's go ahead and look at that a little bit closer, and I'll turn it over to Chuck. Thanks, Andrew. So Andrew just went over an open system and how we can use that to fulfill our customer needs. Um, and he also talked about how an open system is made up of kind of three different categories that we usually hear about. One being like open distribution, the other being open tools, and the third one is on open protocols. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a deeper dive on open protocols. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about what, what do we mean by an open protocol? And we're gonna learn that just saying open protocol maybe isn't quite enough. We really wanna say open standard protocol. 
But when we're talking about open in the context of a technology, or in our case, we're really talking about a, a communications protocol, a BAS communications protocol. By open, we're really talking about a manufacturer that would have access to that communications protocol or technology, and then they can develop different solutions based upon that specification. So that sounds like a great thing, and, and it is a good thing. The challenge and the danger of it is, is usually one manufacturer owns that technology, and then they're giving that to others so that they can, they can develop off of that. And often they aren't going to give everything with that technology. They're going to keep some of that to themselves. Um, and then what can also happen is in the future, as that manufacturer that owns the technology and you know, they start putting in new features and all of that, they may or may not share that with others. And even if they do share that with the others you know, as part of that open protocol, they're, always, they're not going to be at a level playing field. They're going to have that, that the owner of that technology is always going to have an advantage over the others. And so that's why we really want to focus on more open standard protocols. And that standard part of it, we're talking about is having this governing body that's really responsible for, for that communications protocol. And if we can, we really want to have different disciplines, whether that's the vendors themselves, the manufacturers, educational is usually very, you know, very much involved, end users are critical, and just having a very diverse group that forms that standards body and then can create that technology or communications protocol is really what we're talking about here. Other things that that standard um, body is usually responsible for is the education of that communications protocol, um, the advancement of the technology, which is really critical because we don't want to have a protocol or technology that starts off and it's good in, on day one, but doesn't evolve over time. And we'll, we'll see with some, some open standard communications like BACnet how it's changed over time so it can meet current needs. And kind of the final area of that standard that gives us when we talk about open standard protocols is the standards body usually also is affiliated or has some sort of mechanism so they can do some qualification on, on products. So we can validate that those products actually um, comply with that communication protocol standard. So just we'll go real briefly over this one as we talk about open standard protocols. Um, protocol again is just, you know, just at a high level, just a way so that we can have two different controllers be able to communicate. Hopefully that's between different vendors to help build out our open system. Um, I just have a table here. Um, if people are familiar with the OSI seven layer model, this is a really compressed version of it. But this is kind of what I like to talk to like technicians and even system integrators about is as we have an open standard protocol and I have a few listed here and we could have a new one that comes along in, you know, in the next years. These are kind of the, the protocol attributes that I always like to think about and talk about as, as we talk about communications protocols. And the real important one is that, that top one when we're talking about what information are we sharing? A BAS communications protocol should have a pretty clear definition of the points or information or the data, however you want to call that. And every protocol have a different name. The name doesn't matter. It's more that we have a good definition of that for um, open standard protocols, and we can talk about that as system integrators. So in our industry, um, BACnet is far and away the most common open standard protocol. So just going to talk a little bit more on BACnet just because it is so prevalent within our industry. So BACnet stands for you know, Building Automation and Control Network Protocol. Um, I'd say the key takeaway here, though, is it, it really came out in 1995, developed by ASHRAE. It was part of a committee called the SSPC 135. Um, and it's been around for a long time, and it's evolved over time. And, and that's one of the key components of seeing an open standard protocol is, is noticing that it's evolving and, and able to meet new um, customer needs. Um, and ASHRAE, of course, does a great job of, of having a lot of rigor in all their standards and, and, and guidelines that we often specify. Um, this communications protocol of BACnet is, 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 one of, you know, is in that same vein for sure. Um, I'll just leave a little takeaway on BACnet that, that as, as you know, I work with a lot of different open standard protocols that I think is kind of a key thing that BACnet has that other protocols don't is what's called priority arrays. Um, just to give you an idea, if I want to control a specific point, like a set point, I can have multiple vendors control that point. 
I can have multiple applications control that same point and the highest priority will win control of that point and will give it whatever value we want to have for that set point. And now as we're clever with that and we're working as an open system, I can then release that highest level priority and that point will still remember all of the lower level priorities and it'll now use the next highest level priority. It's really conducive to having an open system um, so uh, just a quick little takeaway on BACnet that you don't see in a lot of other protocols that, that, that's used a lot. As we talked about open standards and open standard protocols, there's kind of that testing arm. And for BACnet, that's called BACnet Testing Laboratories or BTL. Um, and, and what you'll do is you'll submit a product. They'll go through a standardized testing of that. And if it passes, then it'll become a BTL listed device. And really what that does is that really helps increase our confidence that we're gonna have good interoperability between other BTL listed devices. So we highly recommend that, that you know, if you're, if you're you know, involved in specifications, um, you're looking for products, look for the ones that have actually gone through the testing and are, are BTL listed products. Um, an, an aspect too of an open standard protocol, because it's available for the masses and the industry, you start to get vendors that maybe you don't even think about that are able to provide very key features for us to be able to, in this case, troubleshoot potentially communications issues that we might run into. Um, if anybody's worked with you know, open standard protocols, you, know, you, you hope that it just works automatically out of the box, but there still is a level of, of um, system integration that needs to take place. And these tools really help with that troubleshooting. Um, I, I see a lot of times we'll have one of the vendors, they'll look at their front end um, types of graphics that they have, and they're not seeing the points quite right. It doesn't look quite right. And they'll, you know, this never happens. They'll point the finger at the other vendor, right? Well, that's great. But what can happen is, is the problem could actually be in the lots of layers of extraction that are actually in that system level controller. And so I, I really try to, from a, a, a system integration point of view, try to use third-party tools. And this is where BACnet is just wonderful because there's so many different options here. So we can do that troubleshooting. And so it isn't Wonder Vendor's tool saying everything looks fine on my side, it must be on your side. We can use these tools. Some are free, some are, you know, you will have, have a licensing on them. But um, the two versions of tools, and, and these are coming from um, BACnetLabs.org, is a, a client piece of software. So what that'll do is you would usually install that on your laptop, you put that on your network, and then you can go out and discover BACnet devices. You could read points out of them, write points out of them, do other services. Key thing whenever you're working with any communication com um, protocol is being able to have something like that as a tool for troubleshooting. The other tool that, that is really important is a protocol analyzer. And so what that tool will do, again, typically it's gonna be on your laptop that you install that. You then can see the communications between different vendors. Um, and, and, and with a, another great troubleshooting technique is you'll actually use both of those tools on the same laptop. So now I might be able to use these client pieces of software because this is an open standard, we have lots of options again, and I could be scanning the network and analyzing it so I can see the communications to potentially see some sort of a you know troubleshooting or, or where is the root cause of the issue. Much more effective than using a single vendor's um, type of tool to be able to, to do that troubleshooting. Um, and we talked a little bit about how you know having a, an open standard protocol, making sure it's almost like this living protocol. We have this diverse group of um, entities that are working together and evolving that standard. And you know, just looking at BACnet again, came out in 1995, it didn't even have capabilities of BACnet over IP communications initially. But as the market and the industry said, oh, that, that's a gap, we need to be able to fill that. Well, that standards group filled that gap. And now we're kind of in the next phase, I would say of that is now the newer standards are, it, or, or new, new needs, I should say, that, that people are asking for. It isn't just BACnet over IP communications, we now wanna have added level of security. Initially, back over IP really is relying upon the IT and IP infrastructure that's in place for the security of that system. So now BACnet um, has come up with what's called BACnet Secure Connect. Sometimes it'll be called BACnet SC. And this is a method of being able to encrypt that back over IP communications. Kind of just came out, kind of a new thing. Um, and we'll see what's 
happening now is we're, we're kind of running into kind of the next phase of BACnet Secure Connect, which will be making it so that the security part of it is, is more interoperable than what it is today in the standard. Um, if you can imagine, it's very difficult to come up with an open standard way of doing security because security, you know, in and of itself, you don't, you know, you, we, we, you don't want to release too much information about how, how that, about what's going on. And so that's where that's kind of going to be more of a phase two that we'll see within BACnet Secure Connect is making some of the certificates and some of the, cert the, the certificate side of things be more interoperable. So Train and a lot of other vendors are participating in what's called this interoperability acceleration program for BACnet Secure Connect. Um, so we can hopefully make that happen um, faster. But again, just an example of having an open standard protocol kind of keeping up with the times and what the new needs of customers are. So now what I wanna do is um, talk a little bit about utilizing and specifying a technology and some of the dangers that can happen with that versus really specifying end user needs, kind of the, that list that Andrew went through. And so what I wanna do is spend a little bit of time on this architectural diagram and, and first of all, I want to start off with, I'm using what's called Niagara Framework as a technology example. Niagara Framework can absolutely be used in an open standard uh, or an open system without a doubt. But what happens is, is, is I see in specifications is we just ask for a technology kind of with the hopes that we're going to get an open system. And you don't automatically get an open system when you specify a technology. We need to have a little bit more verbiage in there so we make sure that we, we are really satisfying those end user needs. So what I wanna do is maybe start off with by, by looking at on the kind of the lower right side, I have a Niagara system level controller. So that would be using a technology of Niagara framework in there. And let's say we have an example of where I wanna be able to integrate in some legacy um, BAV controllers. They're communicating with a proprietary some sort of proprietary protocol. And I wanna pull that in and have that be part of an open system. Great, great solution, great idea. Um, what we can run into though, when we just specify a technology is, yeah, the, the, the a Niagara framework is completely able and capable of having a driver go to that proprietary communications protocol and pulling that into the system level controller. But one danger is what it will do out of the box is that technology out of the IP side of things will actually utilize um, a proprietary communications protocol. And only other things that utilize a Niagara framework technology can really utilize that communications protocol. So now can a Niagara framework um, device be able to communicate and export out back over IP communications? Absolutely. But if we don't tell it and we don't specify that that's exactly what we want it to have right away, you won't necessarily get that. And you might not have that open system that you think you're getting just by specifying a technology. So let's kind of compare that maybe on the left side, the lower left side, where we also have those three VAV controllers speaking a communi uh, some sort of proprietary communications protocol. And I wanna now use some sort of third party translator kind of a device. What I'm gonna make sure that that device is capable of doing is translating that proprietary communications and exporting out all of that data as back over IP communications. And if you notice, I don't even need, I have a trained Tracer SE plus um, system level controller. If you're gonna use that in the architecture, wonderful, but you don't need to. And that's part of the point of what we're trying to do when we build up these open systems is by using that third party translator and making sure it's only speaking back over IP out of the, out of the top, I can now use lots of different um, supervisory type of controller or, or um, um, pieces of software, whether it's Trains, Tracer, Ensemble, any third-party BACnet system or tool, even Ni Niagara Supervisor, it is capable of communicating back over IP. All of those systems are now able to flow and, and communicate to, through that translator and get the data, just like we were kind of expecting to get out of an open system. So now um, I mean to, to kind of keep going on some of these examples with this architectural diagram. I'd say in specifications, it's very common to make sure we have our equipment that is specified to speak some sort of open standard protocol, typically BACnet. So kind of showing chillers, you know, it could be lighting, could be meters, whatever all that equipment is, typically is going to speak BACnet communication, especially on a newer type of an installation. Great, we wanna build out that open system. So here again, if we go into a Niagara framework, if we just specify technology and we don't say how we want it to be configured, 
we might actually be locked down right away and not able to share that data as part of an open system that we were really looking for. Now, if you compare that to um, trains, tracer, SE+, again, we have a scenario where we have open standard communications on our equipment, backnet communicating equipment. We'll have that go into the tracer SC+, and in this case, it defaults to being configured as a router, a backnet router, and that allows, again, the tracer ensemble, third-party backnet systems, whatever you're looking for there, and Niagara um, supervisor, anything that's speaking back on IP communications, will actually talk through that SC because it's a router, and we'll talk and get the data right natively from the equipment. And this is a key thing, because one of, one of the things that Andrew had talked about that's a key customer feature is, we wanna be able to access all of the data. That allows you access to all of the data because you're getting it right at that equipment level controller. Let's go back to the, the Niagara system controller example. Um, even if we specify and we wanna have back over IP communications, if we're not careful, what can happen if we're, again, really focusing on just that technology, the Niagara framework technology, Usually the way it'll, it'll, it'll will work is um, you'll have that open backnet communicating um, equipment that will flow up through that Niagara system level controller. Those will become proprietary objects within the Niagara system level controller, and then they'll get exported out as being backnet over IP. You might go, well, that, that, that sounds good. That's what I wanted. The key difference here, though, is where we have to be careful is um, a technician gets to pick and choose which points out of the equipment are gonna flow into the system level controller and get exported out. So it's very common to have a very small subset of the points that are actually in the equipment that get exported out as backnet over IP. And here again, as long as we specify and we say what we want, we want backnet over IP communications. We wanna have access to all of the data because what happened, day one, maybe those 20 points out of the chiller are good enough but a year or two from now, maybe an end user wants to put in some sort of analytics package, energy management system. And if it's speaking back to communications, if we allow them to have access to all that data that might be available in that equipment controller, but we didn't export it out on day one, that can be a problem. And, and, and here again, just specifying the technology is really the problem, not, not Niagara Framework by any means, because we could actually make Niagara Framework that system level controller can absolutely be a router and operate just the same. But, it, but by making sure we specify the right things, we make sure we're really building out that open system, hitting those, those customer needs that Andrew went over earlier. So again, this is hopefully a little bit more clear as to why we wanna be careful about just saying a technology and specifying a technology ra rather than um, um, actually specifying what we want as end user functionality. With that, I'll pass it over to Melissa, who will go over some of the ways of specifying that, that customer value. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, great job helping everyone understand the different protocols and, and what open means. So like Chuck mentioned, we're going to move into things that are important for customers. So uh, as, we, as we look um, at the needs that, that customers have, we see a, a common sort of feature set that customers desire. And really what, what we hope to do is take the data and make sure these systems are open, that that data is read readable and writable so that we can enable these commonly requested uh, customer features. And so I'm, not, I'm gonna go into each of these in detail uh, in the later slides. So first of all, uh, we move to maximizing potential bidders. And this is really key when we talk about um, the system shall be capable of backnet communications, we see that a lot in specifications. And really, we want the system to be capable of backnet communications. And so that's right along the lines of, of what Chuck was mentioning um, and making sure that we're specifying um, that we have BTL certification and even the points lists that are required to be available via, via backnet Really, by strengthening this item in your specification, you can get better bids from contractors because the expectations are clear. More contractors can bid than if you specify a less common or proprietary protocol. And, and all controls contractors can bid an open backnet specification. So really, this is a way to, to maximize the number of, of people who could bid on, on your project. Moving to standard features, 
Um, so there are varying levels of built-in features across different building automation system manufacturers, ranging from really blank canvases through largely standardized offerings. And so as you're working with your client, understanding what's important to them is really key to making sure that we're specifying uh, all the items that, that they would need, whether that be sort of basic things that you might assume are included, like time of day schedules and, and data trending, but even more advanced features like dashboard and reporting and, and summary screens. Um, making sure that you specify uh, those requirements your customers have rather than the technology that you have ensures your clients receive their desired results. I just mentioned data logs and, and, it's, uh, and trending. And this, this one um, are really, they're really valuable troubleshooting tools. I mean, how many times have you needed to set up a trend after a problem has occurred and then waited to see if it happened again so you could catch it with the trend you just set up? And really strong specification language here can ensure that critical points are trended from the time the equipment is installed in the build, building automation system. This is a valuable tool, not only for owners, but also for engineers, because it allows you to verify system operation during the warranty period. Secure remote access. So today clients uh, need, need to understand uh, their buildings in a remote way. They want to be able to access them when they're outside of the building. Uh, it's, uh, kind of a, a point sometimes of contention between the IT staff and the, the building operator, uh, how they're going to maintain and, and get this access. And so we recommend that you're working with your clients to understand how they will get access to their system uh, and specifying a method that's preferred by the IT staff. You know, there's many options that include uh, VPN, virtual private networks, cell routers, and even BS manufacturers have standardized solutions to keep systems off the open internet, um, which really protects a client's system and their data. Uh, energy saving optimization strategies. So as you know, um, optimization won't get done unless it's really specified in detail. Uh, left to a controls contractor's interpretation, results may vary especially in this uh, you know, post-pandemic world that we're entering. Many, many of our energy saving strategies have changed or require updates. ASHRAE is implementing new guidelines like guideline 36. And incorporating these details into your specifications is really important so bidders can comply. Uh, lastly here, documentation for service. So owners need to be able to service their systems after their construction projects are completed. Documented systems are serviceable systems. So when you know how a system is supposed to work, you're able to fix it. Specify that detailed documentation is included, especially when solutions require a lot of customization. Owners shouldn't have to rely on a single technician or service provider for proper operation of their systems. So specify, uh, don't specify technology, specify the functionality that owners desire. I'm gonna turn it back over to Andrew to give you an overview of a tool that will help you specify functionality. Awesome, thanks Melissa, thanks Chuck. Uh, I know you're all dying, well, you know, don't leave us hanging. How do we actually specify the stuff that, to make sure that we're not missing the marks, to make sure that we have the data we need, to make sure that that things are interoperable day one so we don't get us or our clients into a bad situation. And so with that, I uh, just want to highlight uh, one tool that we have at Train that uh, we can offer to you. Uh, we wouldn't leave you without something that you can use after this webinar. So uh, Train Design Assist is a web-based tool that's provided to you at no cost. Uh, it's, not, it's not all, you know, train only lock down the specification language it's industry standard open specifications that anybody can bid and so uh, i'll show you that and i just want to show some of the the feature sets and functionalities you can get out of this uh, train design assist 
Uh, some of the benefits before I jump into the tool, it, it can really save time. It's, you'll see it's intuitive, it's quick, it's easy to put uh, content together that you can use uh, today right in your specification. Uh, it's very flexible in the configuration options utilized. Uh, and it's not just, it's not just train saying how to do it, though we we obviously have a lot of uh, influence on, on a good design in, in our own tool. We're using ASHRAE standards, uh, you know, guideline 36 or, or uh, you know, ASHRAE standards 90.1 and, and so on and so forth, as well as BACnet ASHRAE standard 135 to make sure that our systems are interoperable and, and, and functional across, across manufacturers. So without any further ado, I'll go ahead and, and uh, share my screen and give you a little uh, walkthrough of Train Design Assist. And so what you should be able to see here is uh, just the login page. It's traindesignassist.com. Uh, you can feel free to come in here and create an a, account for free. Uh, more information on the splash screen. If you want to watch a demo video, you want to see what it's capable of, some examples down below. I'm going to go ahead and get, get signed in. And you can see once this signs in here, my list of projects. So various projects that I've created to capture some design concepts or some to create some collateral, uh, some of which I'm sharing with other people in a collaborative format. Uh, I'm going to show you how quick and easy it is to create a new project. I'll just call this the Holland Building and uh, early concept 150,000 square foot CRE. Okay, commercial real estate building. We'll go ahead and hit save. And now I have my design palette here. I'm ready to go. If I just want some quick building automation style functionality, either at the enterprise, across a campus, or a single building, I simply drag it in nice and easy. I can I can grab some, you know, some configuration options of that building on the right. Maybe it's a new building automation system. I can specify different uh, communication protocols that, that you want. Otherwise, it'll give you standard backnet. I can just go ahead and hit none. And I could go through and start adding some of this, but you know, clicking here, give guideline 36 chilled water plant, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you want to look at what's going on, because this is not all that interesting, and excuse me for looking over here because I'm actually looking at my uh, design palette here, I can look at the guide spec. And what you'll notice here is it's all what we've been advocating for, right? Uh, giving you the language that you can copy paste right into your design specification, to be able to provide the, the functionality that people are looking out of an open building automation system. And it's not just at the building level. You know, say in this, this building, I have an air handler or a chiller or a chiller plant or whatever, just use a very simple example of an air handler. As I go through here, I can easily select what type of air handler it is. And this is not, again, all that interesting to look at, but let's look at the design flows and different things. This dynamically is changing as I select different configurations into the system that I want. And it's not just updating the flow diagram, it's updating the sequence of operation, it's updating the guide specification language that you can use, and it's updating a points list that you can use in your specification and design. And as I go through here, again, continuing to, to configure this device, it will add more and more functionality, more detail to the flow diagram, to the sequence, to the guide spec, to the points list. Once I'm ready, obviously, you know, I could go through here and change everything. I can do other things such as uh, uh, chilled water plants, uh, variable air volume systems, VRF systems, whatever you need other devices, ancillary things like that. Once I'm good, once I'm ready to move on, I can simply publish and select what I want out of the design that I just put together and capture whatever it is that I need for this, this project in various file formats. Let's just say DWG, so I can th throw it in my AutoCAD template and I can hit generate documents, I can download that, I can copy and paste that, 
and, and use that collateral that quick, that easy in my system. And even if you have, if you're multiple people working on this project, you can go one step farther and use this building that I just put together and share it with say, Melissa, who you just heard and hit add, save. And now Melissa is getting an email. I'm getting an email. We can collaborate on that project and we can save it off, design different, share back and forth so that we can have the collateral we need to be successful. Again, now not, you know, not no train uh, proprietary there, a quick and easy way to, to specify the functionality that we highlighted uh, to make sure that we are getting the, the open system that we want and that our customers want out of, out of a good design. And so with that, I believe I will transition into questions. It looks like we have quite a few starting to pile up into the chat here. Yes, indeed we do. So thanks very much uh, uh, for the handoff here. And I guess we'll just open it up to the uh, uh, to the group. Um, yeah, we do have several questions coming in and, and folks can still su submit questions uh, uh, along the way here. And we will try to get to, uh, uh, to all of them, whether here or later, but via email. Um, Let's just start off with, uh, let's see here. What are the best design practices by architectural engineering firms uh, to ensure that controls, drawings, and specifications preclude good open protocols for a long-term success for clients? Yeah, uh, good question. I'll go ahead and take that one, uh, Robert. Um, for sure. And, and, you know, we, we need to make sure again, you know, as we look at our, some of the things that we've highlighted today without introducing a lot of complexity into this discussion, because we could have a large discussion about this one question, uh, making sure that you have a uh, back net top to bottom across the architecture uh, installed in a secure way, uh, but with the data set you need. One of the biggest challenges uh, that we hear from clients sometimes is, you know, they want to utilize a new technology. They want to leverage a building management system for dashboarding and reporting functionality or something like that, but they just don't have any open protocols or they just don't have all of the data set that they need to be successful. So they really are lacking to be able to quantify their KPI. So by, 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 uh, specifying open systems, open backnet, and the full data set being available, we can mitigate a lot of those risks from an open uh, standard protocol perspective. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Um, next question: Just uh, is there higher security risk for open system for open systems compared to proprietary systems? I, yeah, I, I think, can take. Oh, I can take ahead. this one. Yeah. So. Uh, when we, we think about um, security risks for any building automation system, they're all required to be put behind a firewall to be secured in a, a proper IT networking configuration. Whether it be open or proprietary, uh, all, all these systems have some level of risk associated with them um, when they reside on a customer's network. So making sure that we do... Um, specify uh, some of these security requirements are, are key uh, to success of the, the overall system. And Chuck, if you want to want to add something, feel free. Yeah, the only th there's kind of a little phrase that they kind of say with this too, security by obscurity is insecurity. And by that, they really mean is, you know, you're trying to say, oh, I'm a proprietary protocol, so no one knows how to use me. So that's more secure. Usually there's a danger with that philosophy and that it still can get hacked, just like Melissa was talking talking about. And 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 I would say the other part of it is as we're trying to build this open system, we're gonna lose out on a heck of a lot if we just start doing proprietary systems and thinking that we're a little bit more secure when in fact we're really not. There's a lot of other things that we can put in place, firewalls, the list goes on and on that we can we can be talking about to really make that open standard protocol part of our open system and make it secure also. Okay, thanks. Uh, Chuck, as long as you're uh, talking here, I guess the next next question is, uh, can you please comment on open source code? Um, okay, open source code, sure. Um, so I would say there, there's some, you know, and open is such an overloaded word, isn't it? Because we, we have that for all sorts of different things. There's some parallels, I would say, to like an open protocol. Um, but usually when you're talking about open source code, that really has to do more with the software development of, of something. 
And so software engineers can go out and, and essentially take open source code, which is kind of the, usually it's somewhat vetted, hopefully well vetted code that solves some sort of a, a problem that a software engineer might want. And by utilizing that open source code within their, their development, they can get a lot faster speed to market. Um, if it's really well vetted open source code, it might give them, you know, you know, e even just, you know, better performance, um, you know, and all th that type of thing, because it's already been, you know, pretty well vetted. The danger with open source code can be a little bit of, of it's open to everybody. And if there is some sort of a security thing that gets changed with the later version of, of open source code, are you keeping up to date? And so I think it's important that um, vendors kind of essentially say which open source code they're being able to, they're utilizing and saying which versions of that open source code. And, and, and you'll, you'll see that a lot of products are, are now capable of doing that, but that might be something to think about making sure that vendors are doing that and specifying what they're using for open source code and the versions of it. Okay. Well, thanks, Chuck. Um, yeah, we do have a number of questions here. Well, let's, let's switch over to is, is train going to start supplying backnet IP as a standard right now? Isn't your standard Modbus or, or maybe backnet MSTP? I guess uh, whoever wants to take that, I think uh, yeah. Andrew. Andrew's yeah, Robert, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and take that. Uh, good question. Thanks for asking that. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of address them in various uh, uh, um, forms here. Uh, the first one was uh, right now, isn't your standard Modbus? I, I would say it, certainly is not our standard you know at train if you will um though we certainly support modbus at the unit level for sure uh you know for for our equipment portfolio to be able to integrate that if if you're if your uh, building automation system needs modbus uh as far as backnet mstp again yes we 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 have a full portfolio of backnet mstp I think that uh, the question here is is twofold. How does Train adopt BACnet IP, and and what's our plan for transitioning at the unit level to support BACnet IP? Uh, right now, today, absolutely. You, you saw Chuck's diagram. You know, we we can supply BACnet over IP data across our portfolio uh, at the system level by utilizing the Tracer SC Plus or some some. Not all of our equipment supports BACnet over IP at the moment. We are transitioning over to BACnet over IP unit controllers. So for sure, uh, as, as a full product, we also offer uh, BACnet over Zigbee uh, wireless, which we brand name is AirFi. Uh, so that's also ASHRAE 135 compliant. And by utilizing uh, uh, that with a Tracer SC Plus, we can get that wireless and route it into IP. So very flexible architecture at Train, I would say for, in terms of supporting various various uh, levels of the architecture for BACnet. Okay, thanks. Um, how would you classify Tritium systems, uh, open open or not? Well, I, I can take that one. Um, so, and, and part of what I was trying to explain and kind of in that, that architectural diagram is you know, when you're talking about Tritium or Niagara Framework, again, that's really a technology. So, so I hate hate saying you know it's open or it's closed because it can be configured in a very open way, which would be a great part of an open standard system. It's just fine, but the defaults make it so it's not doing those things, and it and it and it defaults to being in a closed really environment is what it's doing. Now we can make sure we specify things so that we make it open. But I hate saying it's just open or it's closed. I would say it does default to being closed, though, but can be configured to be open. So me, I'm I'm on the fence with 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 that. <laughs> okay, um, let's just just scrolling down here. A couple of questions on Niagara. What what is the upside and downside to specifying a controls network that meets the Niagara N4 system? You guys, want me to take that one? Yeah, sure, Chuck. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, okay, and, and, and again, I think we're, we're a lot on the technology part again. By, by just saying I want a Niagara system, the big downside is is I don't really know what I got. Um, I have some sort of technology, but what is it that I want it to do? And those go back to the, those, you know, what are what is it that we're really trying to, to give our customers? You know, what do the end users really want? 
I'm very, I, I can't imagine an end user says, I want Niagara, I want a framework, I want a technology, fill in the blank. Usually what they want is I want to be able to pick and choose the vendors I want. I want to have all of the data. I want to do, you know, those are the things that we really want to specify. So I would say the big downside of specifying, just saying I want Niagara N4, which is the latest generation, you know, kind of version of, of the Niagara framework, you're really missing out kind of on, 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 on the point of what we're trying to do, which is satisfy those end user needs. I don't know, Andrew, do you have more to add to that? Yeah, I think you covered it well, Chuck. Uh, you know, the N N4 system, you know, we can be compliant with, with that in a variety of ways, and the N4 system is certainly able to integrate to that BACnet system. So we're not um, precluding the ability to use some sort of other supervisory controller of choice or enterprise or building management system solution at the top end whenever we specify open BACnet. Okay, Andrew. I, I, to to that uh, to that point with Niagara, does Niagara meet all the BACnet requirements and its controllers uh, pass uh, BTL? Yeah, and and I I won't speak to uh, Niagara um, in specifically. Niagara is uh, uh, um, a technology that is is implemented as, as a framework in in a lot of different hardware. So it's not always the same thing. Niagara is not a hardware platform. There's a lot of different manufacturers who manufacture hardware that supports Niagara framework. Uh, if you're interested in BTL listings and, and what, what passes what, uh, all of the protocol implementation conformance statements or PICs as you would find that and, how, and which devices have gone through that, that process are available readily on bacnetinternational.org. And you can, you can do the research yourself if, if you're interested in finding What's out there? I mean, I might just add just a little bit to that, and and that's, you know, what is submitted to BTL. That's what they're going to test. So what can happen is a vendor using whatever technology you're talking about, whether it's Niagara or something else, whatever that whatever BTL gets, that's what they're going to test. So it could be configured in a way so that it passes, um, and it looks great. What can be different though is what's actually installed and put on a real job site. And that's why we wanna be careful with our specifications. BTL is a great way. I, I think it's a great thing that we should be specifying, but we still wanna be a little bit careful in making sure that someone's configuring their product so that it's still gonna meet those end user um, um, goals. So, so just BTL in of itself isn't enough, but it's a good, you know, kind of a, a low bar, if you will, that everyone we wanna pass. And, and Niagara can meet that, they absolutely can. Okay, well, thanks, folks. I know we're we're uh, we're getting a little close on time here at the end. Uh, I know we have a, a several more questions, but I'll throw uh, at least one more to you. Um, if you have an existing piece of equipment that is communicating on a pr proprietary communication with a factory controller, and you add a backnet card for it to communicate to a new BAS system, can you control that equipment or just read it in the BAS? In other words, will the points be writable at the B at the BAS? So I, I can I think I can take that one in there. Um and, and and I can more talk to exactly how train's going to do that. But but you know if we're talking generically, you do need to be careful because you want to make sure and they should have a list of points that's with that that card or that product and it should tell you exactly what it's capable of doing. Which points can I read? Which ones can I write? So as you have different common interface cards on train products, you definitely will have writable um, points on there so that you should be able to, to control whatever, you know, what, you, what you're looking for. Anyone else have anything to add to that one? And I, I would just add to that, Chuck, the, that by, by um, utilizing those, those tools that, that we advocated for that were listed on backnetlabs.org, you can test that functionality to see if it's writable or not. And if you have a um, if you have a, a pick statement from the manufacturer, that should also, in, in some cases, allow you to understand whether or not that point's readable or writable. Okay. Well, thank thanks everybody. Uh, one more question here. I think we're we're just about out of time. But I'll just say, uh, uh, is Train Design Assist a a separate software from Train Select Assist? Yeah, I got that one, Robert. Thanks. Uh, they are two separate pieces of software. Train Design Assist is that specification tool that Andrew showed you 
uh, that's vendor agnostic, uh, free, to, free for you to use, um, separate from our equipment selection tools that are also available for your, your use. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Melissa. And, and I'm afraid everybody that we're, we've run out of time now, uh, but I appreciate all your, uh, um, your, your great questions and the great presentation, of course. Um, now for those questions that we didn't have time to answer, we'll be getting back to them. We'll be getting back to those uh, askers via email. Um, so that concludes today's presentation though. So on behalf of HPAC engineering, I'd like to thank train for sponsoring today's event. And of course, uh, all of you for joining us. Um, so uh, please check it out. HPAC.com uh for to uh to view this in the future and uh everybody just again thank you for everything and have a great great rest of your day